Thank you, Daniel. Um, okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second slash third day of um, of Camaleo World. Camale Camaleo World. Sorry. <laughs> um, today, I'm going to present to you a resilient Camaleo multi-node infrastructure for carrier services. Pretty much what we did, how we did it. Uh, it's a study case. So um, allow me to make a small uh, introduction about who we are. Um, to give the whole presentation a little bit more context. So we are an uncommon cloud communication service provider. Uh, and even though we do have multiple solutions on offer, zip trunking has always been our core. So what do we actually do with this? Well, we have positioned ourselves uh, between small, medium, and a, and a bunch of uh, large uh, users and the big operators. This with the intention of uh, having the traffic going back and forth between point A and B. Now, why though? Well, this is a win-win-win situation for everyone, pretty much. Uh, from the user's perspective, they get, to, they get a, a little bit of trouble, well, they get specialized, tr specialized troubleshooting um, on either current installations or new installations. Uh, number reporting tends to be a little bit, a little bit tedious you know, with a lot of paperwork involved in the US, so we actually help them with that and pretty much trying to demystify voice over IP for, uh, for a bunch of these customers. Um, from the big operator type of uh, perspective, it's, they get to have a, a kind of cookie cutter type of uh, mentality with us, so they only have to provision us mass channels instead of having to specialize on different type of installations. And uh, well, troubleshooting has been minimized. And from our perspective, well, we're just glad to help. But actually, also, we really enjoy trying to, um, trying to normalize the different uh, interpretations of the RFCs across the board, since multiple different PBX uh, manufacturers and operators, they have different type of interpretations of this. So a brief uh, history of um, how we got where we are. Um, we are primarily an open source shop. So uh, we have implemented multiple uh, open source components and uh, code processing is not an exception. Uh, when we actually started, we started with just this, a Pentium system running SIR 8.12. Almost right after, we, um, we, we had our first attempt of redundancy, which was pretty much putting all of, both of uh, another system, the same system, on a, on a hardy type of uh, environment. So we, they were sharing a virtual interface, but uh, this, didn't, this didn't work too well, since uh, the last thing that would actually die on one of the systems would be ping. So it, it didn't actually work as we expected. So given our fabulous infrastructure, which was actually fairly simple, as you guys can see, um, we were just working fine. But at the same time, the, our relentless sales team proved the whole, the whole infrastructure, this fabulous infrastructure, completely obsolete and not scalable almost immediately. The amount of load that the system was handling, it was tremendous. So this triggered um, a light bulb, which was uh, trying to define the type of responsibilities and functions that the system was actually doing. So after defining all of this, we started thinking how we can, can we segregate the, all of this functionality on, on, different, on either different servers or different uh, systems. And that's when we started with Camalia. That was our first baby step towards, the, towards using Camalia. And um, the first step was to create an outbound uh, proxy that would just unload the, all, the, all the outbound traffic from from our main node towards a second proxy that would just, that would authenticate and then uh, route to the specific PSTNs. And this was, as I said, the first step towards like what ultimately looks like this. A multi-node, multi-layer infrastructure with, uh, uh, with the following layers, actually. A user facing load balancer, a registrar or um, a presence layer, an M plus one proxy layer or just proxies, and the carrier facing load balancers. <coughs> now, uh, looking into a little bit more detail about the load balancers, 
uh, the user-facing load balancer is it's a user landing point. It's a known, a trusted IP address for the users, so they can just deliver traffic to a specific place. Um, they deliver traffic uh, towards the different proxies based on either the method or the amount of uh, or the amount of load that it's being handled. It is capable of you, uh, of uh, detecting and blocking zip bursts based on the Pike module, as you guys might uh, know it or not. Um, it can. Um, it also detects the type of transport protocol that the that the user is using, or it, it requires. So it actually actually uh, does that also, and uh, it verifies the request URI format if it's 10 digit, 11, an international number, or e 911 From the carrier's perspective, the carrier facing load balancer, uh, it's a carrier or operator uh, landing point. So it's a trusted IP address for them to know, to to deliver traffic to. Um, it does number verification, number status verification based on the group module, um, just detecting if it's a disabled, deactivated type of number. It can detect and block also zip burst. The it, it, it could be attack traffic to one of our um, one of our users, and it load balances towards the the proxies. The registrar servers are extremely uh, skinny. They are responsible only to authenticate the users. And um, once they have authenticated the users, uh, they manage the it, it manages the location table, a location table, and it uh, then replicates across the different uh, presence or registrar servers, everything on the same layer. Now the M plus one proxies. This is pretty much where the magic happens. It's this system is the one responsible for authenticating and authorizing uh, <coughs> users for outbound traffic. Uh, to deliver outbound traffic, uh, the, it creates the routes towards the PSTN. It can uh, detect and block uh, known route routes, which happens pretty often. Um, the e one header preparation, that's something that I will talk about a little bit uh, later on corner cases, but it prepares pretty much the headers for the e one um, It is responsible for preparing the request URI towards the users. So if the user wants something completely specific, uh, it will be done there. Uh, it's heavily, it uses heavily the, the, al the alias uh, module. Now, it also handles the user-to-user -user traffic. And um, it is responsible for alternate routing based on error codes or just lack of uh, response. Now, what is better than having a multi-node, multi-layer infrastructure? Well, having two. So this was the attempt and what we actually uh, ended up building, which is two different nodes in two different places, which uh, opened a completely different world of, uh, of possibilities for us. Mainly mentioning some of them, it's the, that we now are able to load balance across different data centers. And, um, it, all, it also helps with the maintenance because we can actually do maintenance now and, um, and customize routing. Now, the other thing is that it, it, gives, it gives a lot of flexibility both vertically and, and horizontally to add or remove servers. Uh, but that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for two main components. One of them, orchestration, and the other one, uh, the, a database infrastructure, a solid database infrastructure. Just to give a quick overview of the database infrastructure that we have, it's a three different hierarchy uh, type of infrastructure. The first one is the master, which is responsible for just provisioning uh, changes. Uh, when there is like a, a, a major provision, provisioning change, it happens just on the master. It's been written in the master. The slave slash masters are responsible for everything that is presence related, subscriptions, registrations, or published messages, things that are not going to be uh, Things that are way too chatty for the for the master to actually handle, and the slaves are act, the actual uh, tables being used by Camellia. Now, under orchestration, we have defined for provision in specifically we had we have defined three different um, main steps. The first one it's um, is the pla the platform uh, provision the platform. The second one is the configuration, and the third one the mon monitoring. Now, for the platform, even if it's either if it's bare metal or it's a container, um, once the the OS it, it has been provisioned, we use Ansible playbooks to just do a preliminary configuration of the of the system. This means installing Camille on a, on a specific type of revision, 
or uh, MySQL, et cetera. Once the system has been provisioned in that sense, we have a specific configuration for the set system uh, with, that, that is based on the templates that we have on a Git repository and using Ansible playbooks to get the templates and also using Homebrew's uh, scripts, which are actually on Python, uh, just run set scripts and um, provision the server specifically for what it's intended to. And for monitoring, we actually just use PRTG and, and specialize the scripts on PRTG. Now, another uh, interesting um, reason why we, uh, or, or another use that we have for, um, for Ansible and orchestration in general, it's uh, coordinated reloading of modules. So instead of having, uh, instead of going into each system to reload uh, modules, because that's pretty much what we used to do, we now have a um, more reliable master database entry on, on the portal, for example, that al also push uh, an Ansible playbook that will then reload across, either across the board um, for the, uh, the modules on Camailio, or it can be also fairly, um, fairly specific, fairly targeted, and um, also quick and secure. I mean, it has reduced the, the amount of human error by a little bit, just by a little bit, but enough to, for it to be, you know, actually reliable. Now, this is more of a design. It's, some, it's something that it's not fully uh, baked, but, but we have uh, also under all the, um, under orchestration, we have defined a regression tester, which pretty much uh, coordinates point A and B, either a PBX or OCP, uh, to run multiple scenarios across our, our infrastructure. One, once it, they run, uh, we analyze both, the, the, the whole idea is to analyze both ends and see what happened pretty much in the middle, if, if, and if, and if everything was uh, successful or not. Uh, but yeah, so to, uh, to coordinate all of this in the regression tester system, it's pretty much, the idea is pretty much using Ansible again. Now, going a little bit towards the the corner cases that I was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, for e one our responsibility using a specific uh, type of operator is to make sure that we add an, uh, a, a valid PEI header containing a, a valid and registered 11-digit number, US, uh, US number. And um, well, how we do this is that based on the, on the, mod, on the AVP module, we create a relationship between the e one number for a user and whatever the user can present to us on either a header or a value itself. Uh, this tends to be a little bit difficult for a, a couple of our users because they have multiple sites or they can, or the, the PBX manufacturer couldn't handle something specific. So that's why we have different options that we offer to, to them so they can present something specific. Between this, we have the PAI headers. It's, a, it's on a hierarchy level. Once one of, the, of them is it's met, uh, it kind of stops. So it's the PI header, the PPI header, a from header, a sort of the source IP or the credentials. Now another current case, it's um, the disaster recovery in uh, forwarding. We have designed, uh, we designed the disaster recovery just to protect the users from themselves and it's pretty much alternate routing. So whenever a user it's unreachable or um, it's having some troubles or it's presenting a specific type of error, we make a second attempt to either another location or to a PSTN number. Um, it, it depends a lot on the, on the alias module. Now, something kind of curious, and it's a strange phenomenon, is that we never did actually design forwarding, but a couple of, uh, of our users uh, fairly creatively started uh, forcing DR, so forcing disaster recovery, and making and building the future of uh, call forwarding, and now it's a future. <laughs> now, Last but not least, uh, something that we started adding into, the, into our whole infrastructure are just the media gateways. So we added two different types of media gateways, a couple of them that are directly on, the, on user prints <laughs> and in between of our infrastructure. This with intention of better troubleshooting for, for our users uh, what it's going on on the, on the traffic on, or on the, like, on the nether. Um, but the main uh, reason is that every single one of these nodes, um, it's an airline node. And this with the intention of start rating 
the QoS on, on most of these nodes on a, on a per call basis. Now, the way we actually calculate this is it's a mix between the traffic that it's being seen by the system and the, and, um, and the RTCP uh, reports coming from both ends. Um, there is a proprietary algorithm for now that, it's, that it calculates all of this, and then it presents uh, some value. But I think that's pretty much it. So on summary, we really wanted to uh, present what we have or our infrastructure as a Camalio st uh, study case to start contributing back to the community. This is, this is the first time that, uh, that I'm here in, in Camalio world. And um, this, it's, we're really eager to start contributing back. Um, and also, please feel free to send any type of questions, comments, thoughts, uh, criticism to um, our uh, distro, which is camailio at nextvortex.com. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Here, two, first here, and then Sven. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, you. Uh, you didn't, you, you showed the database uh, hierarchy you, that you mm -hmm. built. Where do you uh, generate CDRs and where do you store them and how uh, that, do you replicate that, that's them? That's a really good question. Um, so for the CDRs, we do something kind of, um, we started um, mirroring the traffic, not port mirroring, we just used tabs at the, be at the beginning. So we had a separate type of, uh, of system that was handling everything that was the actual uh, SIP messaging and making the, D, uh, the CDRs based on that. Now, after having, those, having that information, we put it directly on the master also. So the master, it's heavily used for that, for both the CDRs being analyzed on a separate system beforehand and just being introduced by, uh, directly into the, the master database. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, you've showed me, uh, you showed me, uh, a much of uh, failover, uh, balancing, and so on. And the question, have you ever tested it in a while? So for example, just uh, turn off uh, part of the live system. Uh, so have you tested it? Yeah, we do that pretty often, actually. But it was part of the, the whole um, resiliency of the, of the system. It was to actually shut down a couple of those systems and have, the, have specific routes that would go that would take another route <laughs> to just make the things happen. Yeah, it was quite, quite interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>